Hi, everyone, and welcome to this course on Test Automation Foundations. Automated testing provides confidence about the application under test and working as expected. In this session, we'll cover the steps involved to gain a strong test automation foundation and explain model that helps us to determine the types of automated tests to use on a project and share tips on getting started with test automation, choosing test tools and decide what to automate and close with strategies to maintain test automation over time. Let us start on a quest to discover how to succeed with test automation. This is something that you need to learn and watch in these sessions very closely. Thanks a lot for watching this session. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the session. Throughout this course, we describe different types of automated tests and how to implement them. No prior knowledge is required but it would be helpful to have a basic understanding of test automation. Let us write some test code and demonstrate how to use standard testing tools. For code examples throughout this course, we will use Node.js, although again, no prior knowledge of Node.js is required. We include a test application that we refer to throughout the course. If you would like to follow along, feel free to download and set up this application. We can also use this to write our own test. That is for this session. Thank you so much for watching. Keep an eye on all the test modes and all the test articles. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the session. Now, every product team strives to deliver flawless software in spite of this effort. Software will inevitably have defect. Now, manual testing provides a great value by exposing defect. It's very time consuming to manually test the same scenarios repeatedly. Now, automated testing follows the same steps as manual testing, but it's quicker. There's an initial time investment to write the scripts. Once the scripts are complete, they can run repeatedly without much additional cost. Now, maintenance will be required, but it saves time in the long run. This makes automation have a great return on investment. In addition, the exact same steps are executed every time, which reduces possibility of human error. Now, automated tests can run across multiple platforms, operating systems, and devices creating thousands of combinations, which is great at stimulating different setups and use cases. Bugs and regressions can be found quickly, giving confidence to the developers that updates to the code break didn't break anything. At the end, teams with automated tests will create better quality software products. These products can then be released easily and quickly, having used less resources. That's it for this particular session, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the session. Now, there are different types of automated integration component, functional, and UI test, and the list goes on. Deciding which test to include for a project will be a difficult task. Fortunately, there are some models that are extremely valuable, which determines the type of test to automate. One model that we recommend using is the Agile Testing Quadrants. It's used to classify tests. Quadrants have been helpful over the years for teams as they plan the types of tests to be implemented. It also helps teams to identify the resources necessary to accomplish that task. This model was developed by an Agile testing consultant, Brian Merrick, in 2003. There are four distinct quadrants, separated by the X and the Y axis. On the bottom, it is technology-facing test, and on the top, it is business-facing test. On the left-hand side, there are tests that guide development, and on the right, there are tests that critique the product. Now, these quadrants define four areas to classify different types of tests. Now, let us discuss about what each quadrant means. Let's start with quadrant one in the lower left-hand side of the matrix. This quadrant describes technology-facing tests that guide development. These type of tests are always automated and they ensure the functionality is working as expected and the code has a quality foundation to build on. Instances of tests that fall into this category are unit, integration, and component tests, all of which confirm the code is working as anticipated. This is an important quadrant and the most number of tests should be written in this area. Tests in quadrant one are written alongside development and help to confirm the functionality of the feature as it's being built. Moving up to quadrant two in the top left-hand side describes business-facing tests that guide development. These tests can either be automated or manual. They help answer questions and discover information about that particular application. The results of these tests help to validate the features of an application. Instances of automated testing that fit into this category are functional and UI test. Manual tests in Q2 use models like prototype or mockups that can include more high fidelity prototypes such as complete web pages. Tests in quadrant true are likely performed during and after development. The automated test should be included in the definition of done for a story to know when a feature is complete. These tests will also help to uncover bugs and issues in the application before releasing the software to the public. Further moving to quadrant three in the top right-hand side includes business-facing tests that critique the product. This quadrant includes mainly manual tests, 
can benefit from automation as well. The tests here provide feedback about the current state of an application and whether things are working as expected or not. They're user-oriented and help to understand the user's experience by how they interact with the application. Quadrant 3 involves critical thinking and an in-depth observation of the application's workflows. Instances of tests in this quadrant include exploratory, usability, and A-B testing. Tests in Quadrant 3 can be performed either before or after development is complete. The purpose is to provide information about what can be improved in workflows in the application. And finally, Quadrant 4 on the bottom right-hand side has tests which are technology-facing that also critique the product. These tests are all automated and built with the help of specific tools. Their purpose is to provide targeted information about the application. Instances of tests that fall into Quadrant 4 are performance, load, security, and reliability tests, and much more. Likely all of the tests that end with utility falls into this category. Quadrant 4 tests are performed based on priorities or what is most important in the application. For instance, a fast page load time is important and it's probably a good idea to implement performance testing. These tests measure data, which can then be analyzed, quantified, and visualized in some way. There are no hard rules about what types of tests must go into what quadrant and what tests are necessary to a software project. It's all really circumstantial. In addition, the quadrant numbering system does not involve any kind of order. There can be a focus on implementing quadrant 2, test first, and then quadrant 1, or vice versa. It doesn't require tests to be implemented in each and every quadrant. The objective is to understand that there are many different types of tests that are either automated and manual and identify what are the most important types of tests to implement. Now we use the test quadrants to guide our team when discussing which tests should be implemented for a particular software development project. Continue to think through the quadrants as our team does, planning, development, and releases so that our whole team understands the importance of testing. But that's it for this particular session. I love this topic. You should love it too. Thanks a lot. See you later. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the session. Now, another model we always prefer back when planning test for automation is the test pyramid. It explains an ideal way to structure test. It is a visual representation of the recommended amount of test coverage that should exist across each type of test. Now, this concept was introduced by Mike Cohn in 2009 in the book Succeeding with Agile. The test pyramid consists of three levels, unit test at the base of the pyramid, integration test in the middle, and the UI test on the top. These test types are the usual suspects on software projects. At a minimum, we recommend that projects have at least these three types of automated tests, but can have additional types of tests as well. The test at the base of the pyramid will be the fastest running test. As you move up the pyramid, the test becomes slower. Similarly, the tests at the base are the most isolated in what they test as we move up. The tests become more involved and more integrated with different services. Now, unit tests are always at the base of the pyramid. They test a single function by calling that function and passing in various values. Unit tests confirm that the right results are returned for each and every one of them. Now, if you look at the unit tests that confirm that the right results are returned for each and every function, they are the fastest test and run in a matter of milliseconds. There should be the greatest number of these tests and data for a unit test is typically mocked or stubbed, which are ways to create objects with certain values. Jumping up to the middle of the pyramid are the integration or service level tests. They test multiple services in conjunction to ensure that all parts work flawlessly together. They typically involve testing integrations between the database, file system, and other applications. API testing is also very popular here. Integration tests take a bit longer than unit tests, typically somewhere between 10 to 100 milliseconds to run and then create their own data. There should be a good amount of these tests to cover each service. Now, user interface or UI tests are at the top of the pyramid. They're extremely valuable because they test end-to-end -end workflows and simulate user actions like clicking and typing. These tests run through the browser and thus take many seconds and sometimes up to a minute to run depending on the workflow. Now, there should be some of these tests that cover each primary user workflow. The pyramid is intended to be a model of what a healthy, fast, and maintainable test suite looks like. It encourages the team to be wise about a strategy of what to automate at each level. Be conscious of the amount of tests that are written or else they can be negative effects. For instance, at times, teams want all unit tests on a project and don't really care about any other type of test. The shape of testing here ends up looking like a big square. While the tests execute quickly, there will be some testing holes where bugs can slip through or maybe a project has a large number of UI tests, testing every single part of the user interface. Now, there are minimal number of integration and unit tests. Perhaps everything looks all right in an application, but at a lower level, it's not functioning as expected. The shape here ends up being an inverse pyramid. In this case, the tests have a slow execution time and are a pain to maintain. There are many more shapes that can manifest based on the amount and level of test implemented, and at times that's fine. Be sure to consider the pros and cons of the shape and what it implicates. Further, different amounts of tests, the test pyramid can also include many other types of tests as well. We encourage you and your development team to think about what the test pyramid for your project will look like. Recall that the shape of your test might not resemble the pyramid exactly and might even have more than three levels. So that's it for this particular session. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the session. Now let's have a look at some instances of a common type of automated test. First, let us do it through a simple test application. The application called StickerFry allows us to order stickers. It's a simple application written in Node.js. From the home page of StickerFry application, we can see the stickers available. Select the ones that you want to add to cart. Now going to the cart, we can see that the sticker has been added and the total price reflected. Clicking on checkout will then complete the order where we'll see the total again and a message thanking for us for our order. Let us now take a deeper dive into unit tests and look at some instances of unit tests written for the StickerFi application. Unit tests are critical for the success of an application. They help to make sure the functionality of the application works as expected. They should be lightning fast, simple, and test only one thing. Let us now focus on practical instances of unit test actually looks like. To do that, we jump over to the Atom editor and look at the code for the StickerFi application. Once the editor is open with the code for StickerFi application, we focus on the model cart.js. This model has four functions which define the behavior for the application. First is the add function on line six. This function simply takes in the item and ID and to add it to the cart. Next on line 17 is the reduce by one function. This function takes an ID and reduces the quantity of a sticker by one. On line 28, there's the remove item function. This function takes an ID and removes all quantities for a given sticker. And last on 34 is the generate array function which creates an array of the stickers in the cart. Now in an ideal situation, we should write unit tests for each of these functions to confirm that the expected results are returned for each. This will provide good test coverage and confidence about the functions as described. As we understood the model for this cart, we then jump over to the cart.spec.js file under test forward slash unit. And we've already written some instance unit tests for this shopping cart model. This test and all the others that we noticed throughout this course are written in Mocha, which is a popular JavaScript testing framework. Now Mocha tests are written in a behavior-driven development or BDD which means the outline of the test is defined in terms of behavior and it helps to structure tests in an organized way. At a high level, it starts by describing the features which is a shopping cart on line eight. The next block on line 10 further describes the test and specifically the shopping cart model. On line 12, there is before each block which sets up a model for a cart and then a product. Now scrolling down this test class on line 21 is where we set up the first test to add a sticker to the cart. Inside the body of this test on line 22, we call cart.add passing in the product and the product ID to add the specific sticker to the cart. On line 23, we confirm that the cart price is equal to five. On line 26, the next test removes a sticker from the cart. Now inside the body of this test on line 27, we again call cart.add, passing in the product and the product ID to add this particular sticker to the cart. Then immediately after that on line 28, we call cart.reduce. By one, passing in the product ID, which removes the sticker from the cart completely. Now on lines 29 and 30, we confirm that the cart is empty and the total price of the cart is zero. On line 33, we have a test to remove all quantities of a sticker from the cart. In the body of this test on line 34 and 35, we call cart.add. And on line 36, we call cart.remove item to remove those two stickers that were just added. Then on line 37, we confirm that the cart is empty. And on line 38, we confirm that the total price of the cart is zero. Now the last test in this class is on line 41. In this test, we call inside of an assertion cart.generateArray. The generate.array function stores an array for all the items added to the cart, essentially representing the shopping cart contents. Now, without adding any items first, the array begins as empty. So in this test, we wrote an assertion to confirm that this and those are our four tests, basically. Mm -hmm. Next, we run these tests. We go over to terminal, and once on terminal, we confirm that we are in the right location, which is the root of the StickerFi application, and run the command npm, which is short for node package manager and tell it to run unit-test in the class cart.spec.js. Now we notice all the tests pass and it runs in 22 milliseconds. With that, we successfully tested all four functions quickly and easily using the happy path. Now this is sufficient coverage for now, but more tests can also be written to test other paths and use a variety of input. Feel free to go ahead and spend more time writing your own unit tests to better familiarize yourself with these tests and the entire environment. But that's it for this particular session. I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back to the session. Now the integration tests provide confidence that all parts of an application work impeccably together. While unit testing focuses on individual small parts, integration tests focus on the whole. They detect unexpected failures that can happen when one part of the application is fixed and another one is broken. Not all units are peer and unit testable. Some units can only be tested as part of a bigger process. Now integration tests cover important cross-module processes. 
Let us look at an instance of an integration test for the Stickerify test application. Now we jump over to Atom and open integration test class. Once Atom is open, navigate to the integration test class by going to test, integration and open order.spec.js. This is another Mocha test written in a behavior driven development way to describe orders of stickers. Now the test suite uses the assertion library CHAI and a plugin called CHAI HTTP, which provides functionality to perform integration testing. Now in this test, the before each block creates a new model for the cart and a product. The test here on line 26 is called completes and order. On line 27 of the test starts by calling chai, which is chai, dot request, and in brackets you have AWP app, to open up the development server for incoming requests and listen to them as they are being sent. Next, we focus on calling a REST endpoint. To decide which endpoint to use, we head over to roots forward slash index dot JS to find REST endpoints. Then we look for the checkout endpoint. Now this checkout endpoint takes a request, a response, and a next, and it takes what's in the cart and allows the order of what's the cart to be completed. Now going back to the integration test and order.spec.js, on line 28, we call dot get forward slash checkout, which sends a get request to that checkout endpoint. After that, we call dot end and wait for the response to complete and listen for any errors. On line 30, we confirm that the response should have the status of 200, indicating that the checkout action was complete and the order was successful. Then on line 31, we call done, which closes the connection to the server. Now we want to run this test. We go over to terminal and once at terminal, we call npm space run space integration dash test to run the integration test. We notice that this test quickly finishes and takes a complete time of 93 milliseconds. While this test is really quick, it's many milliseconds slower than the unit test as it takes time to start the server, send a request, wait for the response, and to confirm the response is actually successful. So that's it for this particular session, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Hi everyone and welcome to this course on UI tests. Now quick and effective lower level unit and integration tests are sometimes not enough. UI tests can help implement a complete picture of test coverage. Now UI tests are always working inside a browser and simulate user behavior by finishing workflows within an application. UI tests are named end-to-end -end or functional tests sometimes. Because they examine the entire application from the front end UI to the back end database systems, in that function, UI tests are also a mode of integration testing as we expected to ensure that machines and component collaborations all are working together. It's necessary to remember that these UI tests are the hardest to set up. They need an environment that has particular browser types and versions. Now I'll focus on an example of a UI test for the Stickerify application. I'll start by opening up the Atom text editor and navigating to the test data class, following test UI and opening the class checkout.spec.js. This test class uses Mocha along with the help of Selenium WebDriver, which is a popular option for browser animation and Chrome driver to operate in the browser. The test line eight has before the block. So using Chrome, it creates a new instance of WebDriver. Now in line 12, the test is explained and this test computes a sticker to the cart and checks out. On line 13 of the test, the driver navigates to localhost port 3000 where Stickerify application is up and running. Later, driver is used to finding various web elements utilizing their HTML selectors with attributes of just ID and class name and act like clicking. Now let me go with the example of what I'm doing here. The use of Selenium WebDriver to add one sticker to a cart, we do that by clicking on the class element of the button for the first sticker. We'll do the test application in the browser. Click the right button on this Add to Cart button and pick Inspect to open up the inspector. This will highlight the element that we want to inspect and see that it has multiple class names. We'll choose to use, in my case, in one class name called button-success. So going back to the test, we want to apply that class name on line 14. And we can write that that came out as a driver. Find element by class naming using that class name's button success we can click on this directly. Now, after adding the first sticker to the cart, line 15 of the test works to the shopping cart. Line 16 tests on the checkout button. And then lastly, lines 18 and 19 of the test confirm the total of the cart. Now on line 21 of the test, after the block is there, which closes the driver and then leaves the browser. Now we want to go to the command line and test. First, I need to make sure that the dev server is up and running. If it's not running, I can begin it by typing npm run dev. That is working in another tab. So I'll run the UI test by typing npm run UI test and the browser opens up to run the test in the background and then shuts down once it's finished. Now seeing at the test output, the test runs in two seconds. The integration test took more than 50 milliseconds to run and the five milliseconds it took for each unit test to run. Now the UI test took a long time because it created a new instance of Chrome driver to open the browser, run through the test steps of the application, 
send a request along the way, and then close the browser and web driver once the test finished. Now, they are working together in many more moving parts here than the lower levels of testing. So if you're unknown with UI tests, then this can look like uncharted territory. I always urge you to write a few more tests using this method by finding HTML elements to drive actions in the original test itself. So that's it for this particular lecture, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back to the session on the get the whole team involved. Now, when beginning a new software delivery project, it's important to get in the planning, execution, and maintenance of test automation with the whole team involved surely. And expect the whole team in the arena, including developers, testers, and business stakeholders like product managers, business analysts, all of the entire team members can get involved and improve to ensure the success of test automation in any way. The team will make judgments about how to guide test automation for the software delivery project. They can work together, add what types of tests to implement, what tools to choose, who will be responsible for each level of testing, and how to collaborate with stakeholders to decide. Rise by creating a shared big picture to align expectations over different groups. In a cross-functional setting, with representatives, developers, testers, and business stakeholders, spending time and brainstorming the aspects our great automation test suite will have. All the representatives should have an opportunity to share what they think is available in test suite. For example, ask your group of stakeholders, what makes a good test suite? Everyone needs to share their thoughts because something that one person thinks critical, might same will not register in the sake of value for a different person. It might be unexpected to find out stakeholders have different focuses. Use models like the testing quadrants and test pyramid to guide discussion around the important qualities and determine what type of tests will make up the automation suite. Now, doing these practices will assist and ensure that all stakeholders agree on the strategy for automation testing going forward. After implementing the automation test suite, I support getting together as a group every few months for a retrospective. This will help us to identify what's working great with automation testing and what can be better. Now, what type of tests will be included in the project's automation test suite? As once identified by the team owners, determine ownership of each type of automation test. Typically, developers own unit tests because it's written alongside development. Developers and testers own integration tests and testers own UI tests. This is a principle I follow in most projects, but one size obviously doesn't fit all or suit all. Being a team, select who owns the tests for our project because there are specific owners for kinds of tests doesn't mean that there's no different teammates will help work on those tests. Quality is a whole team responsibility. The team approach to testing and quality is most critical when it gets to automating tests. Huge amounts of value provided by automated tests, but to need a lot of time and commitment. When the whole team is spent in the test automation process, it will lead to the best outcome with a test suite that is robust and properly maintained. To get involved in the test automation, there are many ways in the whole software development team. Now, for example, Developers and testers determine test scenarios for high priority features by the help of business stakeholders. Developers think of edge cases for unit tests and integration level tests by the help of testers. And testers write UI test scripts by the help of developers. Lastly, developers and testers can then, you know, kind of report relate test results to business stakeholders. So test automation projects will evolve. Tests will be added here and there, and there will always be room for maintenance and improvement. The team should work together to think of ways to keep an automation suite team so that application always provides the most value and confidence. That's it for this particular lecture. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this session, we usually learn how to select test automation tools. Now, once the team of stakeholders gets together and make a few initial decisions, the real action can start. After deciding how we want our automated test to look, we need to find the tools to support that. Or else, if we choose test tools before we know how we want to express our tests, we've eliminated many practical options too early. Now, select the right tools for the type of desired testing. There are distinct frameworks available for different kinds of tests. It can be tough for a team to come to an agreement about selecting an automation framework but it's good to discuss this problem together to find an excellent solution. One thing we must understand is that there's no accurate test automation solution that will solve all our team's needs. So our goal is to find the tools that look best suited for the job. We recommend starting with a baseline requirement of what the test tools must support. There are two baseline requirements that we use. First one is a type of test to be implemented, and the second one is a language that the test will be written in. For example, a JavaScript unit testing framework. We also recommend to find tools that promote cross-functional collaboration among testers, developers, and business team members. 
Cross-functional collaboration will lead to improved, more testable code with lesser defects. We use the baseline criteria to search for related test tools and then write them down. From that list of tools our team has gathered, there are many considerations to evaluate any given one. We should focus on trying spikes, which are small experiments using the selected tools. This will allow our teammates to learn the tool and the technical details of it to be able to come up with a more informed judgment. List out advantages and disadvantages that we learned from the spike. Bringing this information and analysis back to the larger team will provoke more conversations where the tools can be compared efficiently. The stakeholders will then be able to select the best tools for each type of testing. We shall learn more about that in our next session. Thanks for watching. Hi everybody and welcome to the session on determining development processes. Several type of tests are implemented at different points within the software delivery lifecycle. If we have processes in place about when to write and run tests, they can be helpful. So with respect to writing tests, unit tests are done during development. Typically, test-driven development or TDD is used to write tests before writing code and then ensures that the code written works as expected once the test is passed. Now, integration tests must also be written during development. However, features have to be completed enough to be able to test components working together. UI testing may start during development, but it can be completed only when the feature to be tested is finished with development. For any type of test, you need to decide when in the development lifecycle they should be automated. It also makes sense to think about when to run automation. Determine how tests are going to be executed both locally and with continuous integration. Ideally, before making code changes, engineers on the team must run tests locally and see to that everything is passing. Once changes are done, it's great to have a continuous integration server hooked up to run the test feed. So it's important to run tests often, see that they are passed as the application continues to change. Tests must run green consistently to have confidence in the test results. So determining when to write and run tests is a best practice. Following this process makes a team constantly think about testing and becomes more skilled with automation. That's the end of this particular session, everyone. Thanks a lot for watching. Hi everybody and welcome to the session where we will discuss following test design patterns. Now the software development community has continued to evolve design principles and patterns. These principles and patterns will help reduce the cost of writing and maintaining automated test scripts. We are to look at ways to improve test design to keep long-term maintenance costs to a minimum while getting quick and usable feedback. Now there are some main principles that make sure of a consistent and maintainable automation test suite. Principles like don't repeat yourself, shorten to dry. It helps avoid duplication. Dry ensures that when something changes in the system or the test, only one test component needs to be updated. For automation, Drive will allow test code to be shared and reused. A domain-specific language or DSL describes items particular to a test application. With any item in the application, it's best to provide a descriptive name and use that name consistently both within the code and the test application. Now, using the DSL throughout tests makes them easier to comprehend by anyone on a team. Having a common language allows better communication and collaboration between teammates. Now, there's some more design guidelines to remember. First, each test must have one single purpose. This makes tests have clearer scope, makes them easier to debug, and easier to update if business rules change. Also, tests have to be able to run in any order and not depend on data from any other test. The goal is for each test to be fully contained. Finally, tests must be composed of steps which describe behavior. The technical details of each step have to be defined in a function outside of the test. By abstracting out the lower level technical steps this way, the test will be more human readable. This list of design patterns and practices is not exhaustive. They are the top patterns I like to follow. This list can provide a great start to see what works best for your team and the product. Determine the test design patterns that are important for your team and document those patterns in detail like a project readme. Documentation will make others understand the principles to follow and the structure of the test that you develop. We have reached the end of this particular session. Thanks a lot for watching. Hi everybody and welcome to this session. Let's look at the test tools that work together to make a complete test automation project. A JavaScript application that I want to select test tools will be taken as an example. We have a number of tools that can be used for automation testing. A few provide only one functionality and a few provide many different pieces. All right, one tool I recommend to start with is a test framework. A framework will let you easily write and structure tests in a certain way. It gives consistency with the use of reusable test code for common actions. There are many options for frameworks present for each programming language. Let me share some popular frameworks now. Mocha is fantastic for writing and structuring tests. This framework helps to write tests for Node.js applications. 
It provides browser support, asynchronous testing, a built-in test runner, and the use of any assertion library. All the test examples in chapter one of this course are written in Mocha. Jasmine is another great option for a test framework. It can be used with any JavaScript flavor and does not need a browser or DOM. It has clean, obvious syntax to help write, easily write text, and also has its own customizable test runner. Jest is the other option. This framework is used and created by Facebook to test all React codes. Jest is already included when you create a new React project. This allows for a zero configuration experience and makes it quick and easy to get started with writing tests. Jest has a built-in test runner, mocking library, and code coverage reporter. There are also a few popular frameworks that give a browser or browser-like environment for testing to be done through the UI. Selenium is a classic option for UI testing. It can be used with any flavor of JavaScript and most popular frameworks including Mocha, Jasmine, and Jest. Then we have Cucumber. Cucumber is a behavior-driven development or BDD, UI testing framework. Cucumber will execute specifications written in plain language. The test scenarios inside of the specification use the given when then format to help describe the input action and results of test. It works well with Selenium as well. Cypress.io is one more UI testing framework that is quick, simple, and reliable for testing any application that will run within a browser. Now, there are a variety of frameworks, so I suggest you do some investigation before deciding what you really want to use. Now, a really great thing is that a lot of frameworks support a BDD structure. The advantages of this structure are that it allows for organization of features and scenarios to be clearly identified, and it also allows room for a lot more collaboration between team members. Now, one of the last things that I definitely want to tell you is that it's not necessary to use a pre-built framework like Mocha or Jasmine or Jest, but I highly recommend it as it just makes life easier. These existing frameworks let you get your test up and running much quicker. They make you spend less time thinking about how tests will be written and structured and spend more time actually writing the test itself. All right, so we'll reach the end of this section. Take a look at this section a couple of times. A lot of great information. Thanks for watching. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session on Assertion Library. As we all know, assertions are the backbones of tests. They validate the results and give meaning to tests. An assertion is going to fail a test when the expected results don't match the actual results. We have many assertion libraries that can be used in an automation project. The popular assertion libraries are Assert, which is built into Node.js itself. Jasmine and Jess, they are built into Framework and Chai and Unexpected. And these are standalone BDD assertion libraries. I recommend using the assertion library that comes built into Node.js or built into the test framework itself. Now, no need to download unnecessary dependencies, but if the framework you choose doesn't have an assertion library or you want more flexibility, select any assertion library of your choice. Now, let us look at some examples using each assertion library that I mentioned. We will look at something where we can confirm that a function which adds two numbers returns the right result. The first one is assert. We've seen examples of this in the first chapter, but here's a refresher. To assert quality, we can enter assert.equal, the actual result, compared to the expected result. The assert module itself gives a simple set of assertion tests to verify results. It isn't as customizable as a few of the other options, but it works for simple scenarios. With Jasmine, we use the expect annotation. Expect is really the same as assert, but just a different way of phrasing it. To expect equality, we can enter a phrase expect the actual value dot to equal. The expected value, a huge variety of matcher functions to be used in assertions are offered by Jasmine. And it also allows custom matcher functions to be built. With Jest, the annotation is totally identical to Jasmine, but it's specific to react to test code only. A wide range of matchers are available here as well. Now with Chai, we use the same expert function. But the statement uses matchers split up by periods, so the statement reads as expect actual value dot to dot equal the expected value. There are great custom plugins to extend assertions in Chai, and Chai has integrations with other vendors to make assertions even more powerful. Finally, with unexpected, the syntax is similar, but it simply writes out the matcher in a string format, which makes the statement very readable. The equality assertion looks like expect the actual value in quotes to equal the expected value. It is very extensible and compatible with all testing framework. Okay, so as we saw. There's some differences in syntax, but that's all right. The most important thing is that the assertion statements are readable and what is being validated is made very clear. Look for one that you feel comfortable using and be consistent with it. All right, so I'm going to end the session by just leaving you with that thought. Thanks a lot for watching. Hello everyone and welcome to the session. Now the topic for the session is test results. After the tests are written, the fun can really begin. Now the whole idea of tests is to run them over and over again. With all the tests running going on, it makes sense to have a way to easily run tests 
in a repeatable way and look at the results of those tests. Now let us see an example of running test and reporting results now with Mocha. To begin, I'll go over to my terminal. Once there, there are different ways to run my test. Initially, after the Mocha package is installed, I can specify the location to the Mocha package to run my tests. The command is dot slash node modules slash Mocha slash bin slash Mocha, and then I specify a test file, and this can quickly run my unit test. I can also type Mocha to run all of the tests or passing a specific test trial again. One way that I recommend writing tests is to use the help of our node package manager. I will show you that. I'll go to the project and look at the packages.json file. And in this file, we have a script section. Okay, I already have defined multiple scripts here. Now there are a few really, very really helpful ways to run tests again and again. For example, on line seven, I define a script called a test. And in this line, I run my unit test and my integration test. So let me show you how it works. I will go back to my command line. I can just type npm test to run that strategic color test script. And in it, it calls the unit and the integration test. And I can see here what tests were run specifically in the command that was used to run these tests. All right, we have the results. I'll focus on the output of the Mocha test. Now the report lists the name of the prescribed blocks and then each block test is run and the results are listed with a check mark implying success or an X implying failure. Now once the tests are run, I see the number of passing tests below as well as the total time taken to run the test. So running tests with Jasmine and Jest have similar requirements to get set up and run tests. All the major frameworks have a basic level of reporting that comes with the test runner. Now majority of test runners can also be customized to present information in a certain way and there's also an option to select a test runner that will generate nice and detailed reports if that is what is important to you and your team. So remember, no matter what the tool, make it easy to run tests to a simple command and make sure the results can be interpreted well. So that's all we have for this particular session. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Hi everybody and welcome back. Now in this session, we're gonna discuss on how to identify scenarios to automate and test automation foundations. Here, when each new feature is being implemented, we have to sit down with our team and take 10 minutes to write down as many scenarios as we can think of. Now we shouldn't worry about writing down scenarios that we are too off the wall or not feasible. Now the goal in this stage must be to think of as many scenarios as possible. We shall spend the rest of this session listing some possibilities for test scenarios. We can view products for sale from the home page of Stickerify application. Now, after viewing stickers available for purchase, we can add a sticker of choice to our art by pressing Add to Cart. Now, if you want many of the same type of stickers, then we should continue to click the button, right? Plus, 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 Add to Cart. If you want each type of sticker, then we can add all the options we like by simply pressing Add to Cart on that particular sticker. Now, we're able to see all the items that we have added by scrolling down to our cart. We shall also see a total of the stickers down below at the end of them. Now, once we decide that we don't want a sticker any longer, then we can select it and choose the option to remove one. Now, if we decide that we don't want any of a particular sticker anymore, then we can select it and choose the option to remove all. Then perhaps we don't want any of these stickers anymore and we shall just start over. Now, we can simply remove it and clear out our cart. Once we are satisfied with our order, then we can go back to our cart and we can check out to complete the purchase. For now, we will stop at these 10 scenarios, but still, this is not an exhaustive list of all the scenarios that shall be automated as part of this process. So that's it for this particular session. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome back. In this session, we'll be learning how values are given for each scenario. First, we have to identify a list of scenarios, and then they need to be evaluated. We set a scoring board ranging from one to five based on how valuable each scenario is. The scores for value will be determined based on importance of the feature, probability this feature will be fixed if broken, distinctness of the scenario. Let's work with our team and use our best judgment. For instance, we have the group of stakeholders assign a score for the value of each scenario. We will evaluate a couple of our test scenarios. The first scenario is to view products for sale. It has required feature of high importance. Customer needs to view the items for sale to buy them. This would be fixed instantly, distinct and necessary. So this one gets a score of five. The second one is adding an item to the cart. This also has the required features of high importance, would be fixed instantly, distinct and necessary. So this too gets a score of five. Third one is adding multiple items to the cart. High importance, would be fixed immediately, not very really distinct as adding a single item to a cart. So this one gets a score of four. The last scenario is removing item from cart. This is a good and distinct feature to have, but not as important as being able to add an item to the cart. Medium importance would be fixed immediately and distinct. So this one gets a score of four. The final scenario will evaluate its order checkout. 
which is high importance, is required feature of high importance would be fixed immediately and is distinct. Hence, this gets a score of 5. So this is how money will actually be made. It will be fixed faster than any other issue and is distinct. We will repeat this process for each potential test scenario. The values can be listed and viewed. This list can help bring out the most valuable tests to build. Thanks a lot for watching this session. I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this session, we will get through each scenario and assign it a risk score ranging from 1 to 5. The risk is evaluated on two factors. First, the effect of the feature. If it's broken, how will it be the impact to the customer? Second, the probability of use. How often will this feature be used by customers? Now, we will evaluate the risk factors in different scenarios. Number one, viewing products for sale would be high impact and high probability of use. This gets a score of five. Number two, adding an item to cart. This is high impact and high probability of use. This also gets a score of five. Number three, adding multiple items to the cart. This would be high impact and most likely to be used often. This gets a score of four. Number four is order checkout, which is high impact and certainly has a high probability of use. This one also gets a score of five. We can repeat the same process for any of the scenarios. We can list and view the final risk scores. Risk enables teams to think about how often a feature will be used and what will happen if the feature is broken. Thanks a lot for watching this session. Keep your scores and your risks in mind. Thank you. Hi everybody and welcome back. In this session, we will see how risk and value are critical when considering test scenarios, but it's also significant to consider how much automating a test may cost. We will go through each scenario and assign a score of 1 to 5 for the cost of automation. A score of cost will be determined by how easy will it be to write the test script and how quickly the test will be scripted. Now, number one, view products for sale. It's easy to write test script. Number two, quick to write test script. This one gets five. Number two, adding an item to the cart. Easy to write test scripts, quick to write test scripts. This one also gets a five. Number three, to remove from the cart. Before we remove it, we need to add an item to the cart. Easy to write, somewhat quick to write. This one also gets a four. Number four, remove items from cart. This requires adding multiple items to the cart to remove them. Easy to write and not so quick to write. This one also gets a three. Order checkout scenario would be easy to write and somewhat quick to write. This one gets a score of four. We can also list the final score for each scenario. Most variants can be noticed by assigning a cost to each scenario. Risk and value are critical when considering test scenarios, but it's also important to consider how much automating a test may really cost. Thanks a lot for watching this session. I'll see you in the next one. Hi everybody and welcome back. In this session, we're going to try and identify the value, risk and cost of each scenario for which we have sufficient data to select the best candidates for automation. We will sum the value, risk and cost scores for each scenario to get the total, and then display the sum of the final scores. Keeping in mind these numbers, let's determine the next steps. As the example we used were limited in scope, all scores were three or higher, which is good, but it will definitely not be the case for all features. We shall start working on the data we have and make some conclusions. In this case, we will decide to create a scale as follows. Scores 13 to 15 should be automated, and scores 12 and below less should not be automated. To sum up, we will end up automating the following scenarios. View products, add item to cart, view cart, view total, and then check out order. The above five scenarios would be the most important to prioritize writing test for. Others are essential too, but the main idea should be to focus on these top five scenarios first. This isn't a hard and fast rule. Scoring a scenario on value, risk, and cost, how to quantify this data, and make easy to select what autonomy. Therefore, adopt this model to suit our team's needs eventually. Thanks for watching this session and choose your score wisely. Hi everybody and welcome to the session Test Automation. Test Automation is a continuing process. This process produces best results when combined with strong foundation which continues to build steadily over time. It requires teams to invest in the test and to follow good standards. Now, there are three simple rules to maintain a good test suite. The first rule is valuable test. Our automation test should always deliver value. It's a good to revisit the test over time and have a retrospective on them regularly to determine if it needs any improvements. It's all about quality over quantity. 
Focus on automating what's important rather than number of tests written. Treat test code like production code and give it the same level of importance. The second rule is reliable test. It is imperative that tests provide the same result every single time. Also have a plan in place for mitigating failure. Failure is going to be inevitable, but it's necessary to have a plan for addressing the failed tests. Now, it's also good to have independent tests where the execution of one does not affect the other. Similarly, run tests in a dedicated environment and not to interfere with other environments. The last but not the least is fast test. Try to keep executions as quick as possible to have faster build times which enable us to release the code faster. Parallelizing tests allows many tests to run concurrently, which helps us reduce the total time run. Limit testing in the UI in order to have more focus on the faster lower level tests. Keeping all those important rules in mind about maintaining a healthy automation suite saves a lot of time and eventually saves you a lot of money and effort. That's it for this particular session. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, and welcome to this session. Test automation is an ongoing process and maintenance takes a larger portion of that process. The three main parts of maintenance include adding new tests, updating old tests, and fixing failures. Now, with new features in a software development project, will require the newer tests be added. Individuals working on the new functionality, we can discuss how it will be tested and what type of tests will be created. With new applications coming up, tests can get outdated. So it's good practice to keep things updated. Sometimes tests will need new test data or a different assertion to validate the results. In some cases, a test should be deleted if it's no longer relevant or the feature is tested has changed completely. It's also unavoidable that tests will fail for various reasons, since the build must always be green. If there's a random failure, find some way to lessen the failure like rerunning the tests that don't pass. It is advisable to isolate flaky tests from those that run consistently. Those flaky tests can be improved and then moved back to the main build once they're dependable. If it's a genuine failure, it's necessary for the test to be investigated and fixed immediately. An appropriate failure might also indicate a bug that needs to be fixed in the code. It is essential to that that the code which introduced the bug be reverted or the bug be fixed. Tests have to be regularly added, updated, and fixed. Keeping a plan of attack for maintenance keeps these changes happening smoothly to ensure a more robust automation suite. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I'll see you in the last couple of ones. Hi everybody and welcome to the session on continuous integration. Now the advantage of automated tests is that they can run over and over again and provide the same result. Continuous integration is the best way to allow automated tests to be run continuously across different platforms and environments. And with continuous integration, tests can be triggered as a result of any new changes pushed to GitHub. Or tests can also be run on a recurring basis, such as every hour or every night at let's say 9 p.m. Now one of the advantages of running tests continuously is that it will likely catch bugs sooner than compared to engineers running tests locally on an ad hoc basis or on demand. Now there are many CI solutions available. We will not be discussing different options here, but we will recommend selecting a solution based on cost, ease of use, maintenance, and support. Now in the remaining video, we will demonstrate setting up our test application StickerFi to work with a continuous integration tool called Travis CI. Now Travis CI is a great option because it is free to use for public and open source GitHub's repositories. It is super easy to set up, provides lots of documentation and support, and allows for integrations with deployment services like AWS, GitHub Pages, and Heroku. So a CI server will require some configuration that typically happens with the use of a YAML file, which is a human-friendly data serialization standard for all programming languages. So YAML file will specify things like the language behind use for the project, any service required, and how to build and run tests. Now the .travis.yml file for the StickerFi project Initially, it starts by specifying the language, which is node.js, and the version of the node, which is simply 8. Now, there's also a section for services, which specifies MongoDB as a database. Travis CI will run npm install to install dependencies and run npm test to run tests in the project, so I don't have to specify those commands. Now, a detailed documentation on how to set up Travis CI with node projects is present. Getting set up to use Travis CI is super easy. All we need to do is sign in with my GitHub account, after signing in, we can enable Travis CI on any public repository that we have admin permissions for. Now moving further down the list, you can see that we have already enabled the StickerFi repository. With this option enabled every time we push new commits to StickerFi. Now Travis CI will read the configuration from my YAML file to build a project and run tests automatically. Now looking at the latest build output, we can see that the build passed. And scrolling down, we can see the job log output which lists all commands that were run during the build including starting MongoDB, cloning the project, updating NVM, and running all the tests in the project. 
So that's all it takes to get set up with a continuous integration solution. So thanks a lot for watching this session. I'll see you in the next Hi, everybody, and welcome back. In this session, we're going to learn about code coverage. Now, for analyzing automated tests, code coverage has proved to be one of the most widespread metrics. Coverage is measured by the quantity of the code that's used within tests. It helps us visualizing which parts of the application are well tested and which are not. Now, like all things with automated tests, luckily, there are many tools that can help provide a solution. Code coverage tools are usually free for open source projects and straightforward to set up. Now, code coverage typically tracks statements, branch, and function coverage. They also provide command line tools and offer nice reports to visualize coverage. Now, to use a coverage tool, a package needs to be installed to the project. Then that tool can be used when the tests are run and a coverage report will be generated. For instance, we will use the test coverage tool called Istanbul, which is widely used for JavaScript projects. Now, Istanbul is used through a simple way by the command line called NYC, which has instructions to set up. So let's go to our terminal and install the command line tool called NYC by typing npm install. Save dev NYC. Now, once the NYC command line client is installed, we can call the NYC test command when running tests to generate coverage. Now, moving over to the test project in our package.json file, we have a script called test coverage on line 11. The script has the same command as the npm test command up on line 7, but simply adds the NYC command to the beginning of the statement. Back at the terminal, we can execute the script by typing npm run test coverage, which will run the test and then generate a coverage report. Now, the coverage report shows percentage of coverage for each test file broken down by the statement, branch, functions, lines, and we can also see the uncovered lines of code. High percentage coverage metrics are shown in green, medium percentage in yellow, and lower percentage in red. Now it's easy to analyze this data and see if there are any trends and determine if any area can use more test coverage. While it's always recommended measuring test coverage for any project with automated tests, we don't recommend having to meet strict coverage targets as a result. For instance, 100% test coverage is excellent, as it means everything is tested, but it can also have negative effects. Now, decouple coverage from purpose to focus on writing the most important tests that will provide the highest value. We should not automate something for the sole purpose of increasing coverage. Instead, use the coverage data to make informed decisions about how testing in a particular area can be improved. So that's all for this particular lecture and session. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this session. We're going to share stories about automation with the rest of the organization or company. Now, there are chances that everyone may not be familiar with test automation. In such cases, it would be beneficial to discuss what problem automation intends to solve. Also, enhance the value of automation so that it's relevant to others. Tests can tell a captivating story about the state of an application. The best way to promote automation is to share wins with the rest of the organization. Share instances like how many bugs automation caught. The main idea behind automation is to help catch bugs faster and before a release and make a note of which bugs were discovered from test automation. You can also highlight how many hours automation saved from manually testing a feature. Another advantage is having higher productivity and being able to spend less time on each release because more of the checks are automated. Now, in terms of team collaboration, it's good to share how automation helps cross-functional team members work more closely together to pair in activities like identifying high-value scenarios and writing test code. Sharing compelling stories of automation backed by data is invaluable. It will create excitement among the team about automation and that time invested in automation is always being worthwhile. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. I just want to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for logging on to this course on Foundations of Test Automation. It's not only been my privilege to teach it, but it's been an honor for our entire production team to make it for you. This course was on test automation, which is exceptionally valuable to the success of a software project, but it requires proper planning, execution, maintenance. So if you're interested in advancing your skills with test automation, put in more time learning and writing automated tests. Building your own automation suite for an application is always recommended and something that I've been saying from the beginning of this course, use first principles, practice a lot, and keep learning. I hope all of you enjoyed this journey of learning test automation with me. It's been an honor and a privilege to teach this course. Thanks a lot for watching and keep watching our videos.